In the beginning, there was a foot. Though over the course of history, many types of human-powered equipment have emerged, it only makes sense that the most efficient form comes from the strongest muscles in the human body, with the foot leading the way. Before the 1900s, motor power was non-existent. One of the biggest technological breakthroughs in history is responsible for many of the world's modern technologies. This development is called pedal power. Had they continued to develop this technology over the last hundred years, perhaps we would see some amazing pedal-powered machines today. But with low-cost gasoline, with the, with the invention of the electric motor and widespread availability of electricity, development on this type of technology stopped. The Solomon Early Technology Lab and Berea College's Tech and Industrial Arts Department has more than a thousand human-powered tools. Faculty member Brad Christensen oversees the lab. Several years ago, an alum by the name of Monty Salmon, he graduated in 1964, uh, contacted us to see if we'd be interested in some equipment that he'd collected. And yes, of course we were interested. And what turned out to be just one or two pieces uh, ultimately became several hundred pieces. Uh, we do a lot of problem solving in this department. We're always looking at ways we can improve things. And by looking at these tools and by studying how they're built and how they're designed, uh, our students gain a new appreciation for how things were done in the past. Building a project in this lab takes a high degree of skill and a considerable amount of time. And their muscles are sore when they're done. <laughs> when we have high-powered equipment, technique doesn't matter that much. But when you're dealing with a very small amount of power, human-powered tools, uh, the sharpness of the tool, the condition of the tool, the way the tool is used becomes very, very important. The pedal-powered ones use a, a, a treadle or a pedal or a velocipede drive system. The treadle is one of the earliest systems and an easier system where the operator is pumping up and down on a, on, a, uh, on a rocking platform of some type and that rocking motion is converted to a rotary motion. The, uh, the advertisements from the late 1800s, 1880s, identify the treadle power as being very simple. That's the basic uh, low power, simple, inexpensive system. The Seneca Falls Manufacturing Company in 1880 started promoting their pedal power system. And the pedal is a longer lever that sticks out. And then they promoted, they were very proud of their independent pedals, where you could pedal with one foot on one pedal. And when that leg got tired, you could pedal with the other foot on the other pedal. The two pedals were not necessarily hooked together. And you could get a lot of power out of those machines. The Barnes Company promoted their Velocipede system, which is basically what we would know of as bicycle pedals. But the Velocipede system is much smoother and is really quite fast and, and fairly powerful. By the early 1900s, motors were becoming more available, less expensive, although even in the 1940s, uh, they were using, motors were still expensive enough that you wouldn't have a motor on every machine. You would move one motor from one machine to another to another. Uh, by the uh, 1950s and 60s, of course, we had motors on everything. The way that has changed woodworking is that we're not quite as careful now. Our tools don't have to be quite as sharp. Our technique doesn't have to be quite as good. And we can still get by just fine. The most common application of pedal power is, of course, the bicycle. And we, we tend to think of the bicycle, in the United States, we tend to think of the bicycle as an entertainment, recreational exercise machine. Whereas in other cultures, it's a transportation device. Human-powered machines have to operate on a very low amount of power. Uh, a human, with, in any type of duration of 30 to 40 minutes, a human can put out about 100 watts of power. That uh, 743 watts is one horsepower. 
So we're dealing with just a fraction of a horsepower, maybe one seventh, maybe uh, maybe bursts of power up to a quarter horsepower, but probably couldn't maintain a quarter horsepower for more than about 20 minutes. With the economic crisis that has our nation and our world in a stranglehold, will there be a resurgence of pedal power technology? We're a long ways from saying that the electricity is too expensive to run my table saw. We're a long ways from that. I would like to see a resurgence in pedal powered vehicles. I'm going to be exploring that possibility uh, this summer and, and in the future over the next several months of building a small vehicle with pedal powered and uh, electric motor with the idea that it could be used for commuting for short distances of say two to five miles. My goal is that, it, that this vehicle would do 25 to 35 miles an hour with a reasonable exertion, um, with reasonable comfort and safety, and reasonable protection from bad weather. Well, our goals are pretty much the same. We have uh, refined them somewhat. Uh, we have uh, done some research concerning regulations and we realized that to be a moped, moped classification, two horsepower, 30 miles an hour. So we were pretty close with that one. Uh, as far as exertion goes, we discovered that a human can do about 300 watts for about 10 minutes, and that's, that's pretty standard. So uh, that's reasonable exertion. And so this car, with somebody pedaling at 300 watts, it, it moves along pretty nicely. Uh, being all weather actually worked quite well with our aerodynamics, but uh, getting the doors to seal just right is going to be a real trick. Uh, to keep it weather tight is, uh, is going to be... Uh, uh, is going to take some work. This prototype is, uh, we're about ready to prime, get the primer on it and get it painted. It will work. It's drivable. We can take it out and drive the thing around. We've uh, discovered things that, that don't work by building this. It's a uh, much lighter weight than what I really thought it was going to be. I mean, two people can pick up the body, two people can pick up the frame. I'd say the whole thing doesn't weigh over 300 pounds empty. So we're excited about that, but still it's too wide and it's too tall. I had three students working with me, undergraduate students, uh, Chris Decker, uh, uh, George Shea, and Noah McGraw. And uh, we each built a different car. We each had different ideas. We each tried different design techniques, different uh, power, different steering, different suspension, different everything. And we really learned what worked and what didn't work. Uh, then during the, uh, the fall semester, I had a sabbatical, and so I took the car home, put it in the garage, and worked on it there, and uh, got the, uh, the chassis to work, got the motor systems working, and then built a body, and spent an awful lot of time building the body for it. So my research toward the latter part of the, my sabbatical involved designing another car. And uh, so I have that one completely designed. I haven't built it yet, but I have very detailed drawings of how it would be. It's a uh, two-seat, three-wheeled vehicle. I'm pretty excited about that one. We realized that uh, there's some forces on vehicles that we hadn't really taken into account. First off, when you pedal a vehicle, there's a lot of force on the chain. There's a lot of force on pulleys and sprockets. Um, there's a lot of force on wheels when you turn a corner. A bicycle is designed to lean, and so there's always force straight down on the wheel. When you don't lean, there's a sideward force, and so that means the wheels have to be a little stronger, a little heavier. Um, batteries. Um, batteries worked out pretty good. Uh, they're fairly heavy, but still they worked out okay for us. Motors. Uh, this is uh, set up for, uh, this should be drawing 41 amps and it's only drawing 25 amps. And so we realize that our controllers aren't working as efficiently as we thought they should. And so that's gonna require some additional work. The steering, we were always thinking either handlebars or steering wheel. But handlebars need room to slide side to side, and a steering wheel either has to go ahead of your knees or behind your knees because your knees are moving up and down. One of the most valuable things we did over the last few months was we surveyed uh, the faculty and staff on campus to see if they're interested 
in a car like this. We discovered uh, that uh, about 65% of the faculty would be interested in some type of alternative vehicle. They're primarily interested in saving on gas, uh, reducing their, their costs that way. Uh, it looked like people that lived within about eight miles are interested in some alternative vehicle. Uh, and we found that about 30% of the people that work here at the college would be interested in buying a vehicle like this if we could sell it for between $1,000 and $4,000.